Well, a warm welcome to this talk. Now, I've found some more interesting information from the World Health Organization when I was looking through the material for the last video on uh, vaccinated uh, vaccination from COVID-19, the updated WHO roadmap. This is actually quite interesting, and there's a few things to say about it. I think the main thing that emerges from it is that Omicron has well and truly saved us from the ravages of this pandemic. All the new variants that we are seeing are Omicron descended variants and no new one has come yet. And I think it's probably unlikely the new one will come, at least in any foreseeable future, because of the massive transmissibility of the Omicron variants and sublineages and how they have basically outcompeted everything else. And thankfully for us, they're much less pathogenic. What would have happened without Omicron is I believe that severe disease could have gone on for, for a longer period of time and more people would have died undoubtedly. So Omicron has saved uh, many millions of lives throughout the world, I am totally convinced. And uh, where it came from, of course, is still uh, a matter of uh, conjecture. It might have been from a person who was um, uh, infected for a long period of time because of compromised immunity, allowing time for viral evolution. And there's still a possibility it came from reverse zoonosis in mice in Africa. We might get an answer to that one day, but I haven't read any research on it. Anyway, let's get down to the information that we're talking about. Um, the COVID-19 weekly epidemiological update. Now, we, we did look at the, we used to look at these quite closely, but they've got a bit boring lately, so I haven't bothered too much. But there is some interesting material in this one, so do, do stick with it. Largely reassuring, it has to be said. The global position, check all these reports out for yourself. So covid a 3.6 million new cases uh, on, on, on the month, last 28 days, down 27%. And of course, this is entirely now a product of testing and how reliable the tests are. We're all being reinfected with Omicron on a regular uh, basis, perhaps once or twice a year if you live in the United Kingdom, for example. You're going to be re-exposed to Omicron. That's Omicron. That's, that's really pretty inevitable because we are endemic. And we know it's at still high levels when the, uh, we, we test for it. When we actually do the tests, we do uh, find it. And that is with uh, reliable or fairly reliable PCR testing at sensible levels of uh, replication. So I am, I am quite convinced by the validity of these tests. A lot of people say that we can't rely on these tests. Well, some of the tests we can't rely on, but some we can. And we do know that there is a lot of SARS coronavirus 2 circulating in the community still. I believe we can say that is, uh, with some scientific certainty, we can say that. Um, now, um, we want that one. So globally, um, three, as we said, 3.6 million new cases in the month, product of testing. Deaths, uh, 25,000 deaths down 39% on the month. Now, there is a, a, a genuine debate to be had with these uh, deaths because we're not really seeing the COVID uh, pneumonias that we saw in the early stages. These are people that uh, where, where the SARS coronavirus 2 infection is exacerbating other conditions in virtually, you can't say all of them, but virtually all of them. So um, we can say that COVID played a part in these deaths, accelerated these deaths. It would be a different thing altogether to say that COVID was the cause of these deaths. Some of them, yes, but the majority, I suspect, not. Hospitalisation is down 9%, ICU admissions down 5% uh, on the month. Now, as of the 26th of March, this is interesting, we've diagnosed, and again, we could debate the, uh, the quality of the testing here, but we've actually uh, diagnosed positively 761 million cases, 6.8 million deaths. Now, the deaths, of course, you could argue that in many parts of the world they've been greatly undercounted, which is true. You could argue in many parts of the world that deaths were that were caused by something else were attributed to, attributed to COVID. For example, in the UK, if someone was diagnosed with SARS coronavirus two and died within twenty eight days, that was automatically attributed to COVID. So we've got great underreporting in some areas and significant overreporting in other areas, and we don't know. Have these roughly balanced themselves out to give us 6.8 million deaths? You know, it's probably not a bad estimate. It's probably so. It's a very significant pandemic, but nothing like as bad as we had feared uh, in the first uh, in the early parts of 2020. So 6.8 million deaths. Um, yeah, I think I think I'm objectively happy to 
not happy, but content to, to sort of accept that number roughly for now, uh, because as we say, there's been over-reporting and there's been under-reporting. But we don't have the data to be completely objective now. Here we see the, the, the pandemic in graphic form. Here we see it, quite incredible, really. Uh, the yellow line is the number of uh, daily deaths. Uh, the blue line is the number of new hospital cases. And uh, here we see the, uh, th th this is, th this will be the number of cases here. Now we do see a huge spike in cases here, of course. And these are in uh, what, what the WHO call the uh, Western Pacific region. And I assume what this means is they've got some way of testing for Chinese uh, uh, data, or adding Chinese data to this, because of course we know that the Chinese locked down. And all of a sudden they, they let everything go for reasons that we've talked about in the past. And uh, Omicron came late to China because they were the only country in the world that really could enforce these draconian lockdowns that kept it at bay for so long, injudiciously, some might say. So th there we actually see the full pandemic. So um, number of new hospital admissions, number of deaths, uh, the red line there, number of ICU admissions and the number of diagnosed cases there in grey. Of course, greatly underdiagnosed to begin with, more recognised in the latter stages of the pandemic. So that's the whole thing in graphic form. Quite interesting, I thought, in one graphic. Of course, th this only goes by deaths reported, by cases reported. Hospitalisations, probably more accurate. So I think we can take quite a bit from that... Uh, from that blue line there in terms of hospitalizations. Do check out this for yourself. I thought that was quite interesting to see the whole pandemic in that graphic. Current trends in reported COVID cases are underestimates of the true number of global infections and reinfections, obviously. Um, but interesting here that the WHO are talking about the uh, infections and reinfections. They don't mention that that will cause repeated development of mucosal compartment immunity, but you and me know that. Um, now, also, this graphic here is pretty interesting, kind of a COVID cases reported by WHO regions. And again, here we see that I'm not going to break down all the regions, but this big group here is Western Pacific that shows all the cases that were catching up in China now down quite dramatically. Um, really quite incredible that a country like China could control a disease as infectious as COVID with lockdowns. Really quite amazing that it did that. And of course, largely the reason that it lifted its zero COVID policy, well, the reason it kept it in place so long was they didn't want to lose face, of course, uh, by, by admitting that the policy was unsustainable. Um, but the reason it was lifted was probably because people were paying bribes to get negative COVID certificates. Therefore, COVID was getting into the community. People that had paid a bribe to get a negative COVID certificate, they were actually COVID positive and therefore it was being spread and therefore it became unstoppable. Um, but whatever there was reasons, it, it, it was unstoppable. And there we see that. And, and what we also see here is this dramatic decline showing now this dramatic decline here. This is really important. This dramatic decline in the, in the uh, Western Pacific region is not because the Chinese started vaccinating 1.4 billion people all of a sudden in December, in December 2022. The reason for this dramatic decline is natural immunity. It can't be anything else because the vaccination numbers in China haven't changed. So there we see the high numbers there in Western Pacific. There we see the very low numbers now in February, March in Western Pacific, specific region. And that is because of uh, the development of natural immunity as a result of Omicron exposure, unless you can think of something else that can explain that drop. I can't. Isn't the immune system a wonderful thing? So that graph really brings that out in glorious uh, technicolor in, in my view. Now, variants, here we have the variants. Uh, th these are the variants of, uh, the sub-variants of Omicron, of course. No new variant, it's good to, it's good to note as, as developed that we are aware of. So data from the 27th of February, 26th of March, 28 day period. Uh, 50, no, 55,000 sequences done. That's, that's a fair sample. This is all around the world. So 
um, you know, 56,000 samples is, is good science. You can get good statistical data from 56,000 uh, sequenced samples. So I'm uh, actually quite happy with that. It's quite a nice piece of uh, collected science that they've done there. Uh, WHO track, tracking variants of interest. Uh, XBB 1.5 is a variant of interest. Six variants under monitoring. And these are all derivatives of Omicron. Now, this, this new variant here, XBB116, uh, is a recombinant of BA2 and BA2, two different. So basically what's happened here is that Omicron's divided into the BA2s, and the BA2 is again subdivided into BA2.10.1 and BA2.75. BA2, uh, but at the same time, um, Two people have been infected with BA210. Sorry, a person has been infected at the same time with two variants, with BA210 and BA275 at the same time. And that means RNA from the BA210 and RNA from the B275 have recombined inside an individual to give rise to XBB116, which is a recombinant variant. Now, the fact that this recombination occurs just shows to me how dangerous the recombination, uh, the co-infection experiments were done, that were done in London during the pandemic, paid for by the UK Health Security Agency, carried out in a Category 3 biosafe lab in, uh, in London by Imperial College. So my, my, my tax money paid for this research, which was probably completely useless. Infecting two cells at the same time where recombination was highly likely to occur. So dangerous research on... on on um, coronavirus was conducted in London during the pandemic. Uh, quite incredible, but this illustrates the potential risk of recombination there. And we look forward to a full explanation from the UK Health Security Agency on why such risky research was taken in the middle of the most populated city in the United Kingdom. Some might think it's strange. Of course, it was a biosecure level uh, three lab, but the Wuhan Institute of Virology is a level four lab, which is more secure than level three lab. And I'll leave you to decide whether that leaked or not. So um, no evidence that any of these recombinations did come from recombinant experiments carried out in, in countries. Genuinely don't have any information on that at all. Not as far as we know. Um, but we do know that XBB116 is a recombinant and they're keeping an eye on it. Three additional mutations in the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. So what we have here is, is uh, two subvariants co-infecting the same person, and by definition, if there's a recombination, I believe the same cell, managing to give us three amino acid changes in the spike protein. Why didn't they realize in London that the research that they did with the likelihood of recombination was 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 there. Very strange. Questions to be asked by the UK government, some might say. Questions to be answered, rather, by the UK government, some might say. Don't hold your breath. I don't imagine they'll say a thing about it. Um, but there you go. That uh, just shows the risk of that sort of research. Um, and actually, when you think about it, XBB116 has got increased function over the uh, two viruses that it came from. Is that gain of function? Is co-infection an example of gain of function? I would have said so. Strange. Anyway, um, reports do not indicate a rise in hospitalizations or ICU admissions as a result of this, which of course is good. But of course, there is an unpredictable, unpredictable nature to that. So it's a risky thing to do. And of course, bear in mind that this was co-infection between between two Omicron subvariants that has occurred naturally as far as we know, whereas the research being done in London was a combination of Omicron and Delta, which is a very different matter. So I look forward to the UK government uh, contacting me or hopefully releasing a public statement on why they felt it necessary to do co-infection studies in London during the pandemic. Now, if we don't hold these politicians to account, I really don't know who else is going to, because it really is uh, strange that they would do that. Anyway, globally, um, XBB, Omicron, of course, variants, 45.1% of infections. 
uh, BAQ1 and BA2, 7.5 have declined. Do all these things matter? Perhaps not too much now because with Omicron co-infecting with Omicron, we've got a lot of cross immunity. Omicron co-infecting with Delta could have been something else. So that's all I want to say about that. The last thing I want to say is a cur- the curious case of the British Civil Service. Sounds like a Sherlock Holmes novel, doesn't it? The curious case of. <laughs> well, this is the curious case of the British Civil Service, who have a remarkably high rate of uh, long COVID. Uh, September and October 2022, the data was collected. 10 to 10.8% of them declared a condition, the condition of long COVID in uh, autumn 2022, 7.4% affecting their day-to-day life, whereas 3.3% in the general public. Now, this clearly means if this data is correct, we need an investigation into what makes it so dangerous to work for the British Civil Service, that these people have over twice the rate of long COVID as the rest of us. Um, that's an interesting epidemiological piece of science to be done there. Unless, of course, this points out the risks of self-reporting of uh, illness. Now, I'm not saying that some people aren't completely debilitated with long COVID. Of course they are. It can be a serious condition. But the idea that civil servants would have more than twice as much as anyone else is just seems absurd to me and shows the dangers of self-reporting these conditions. This means we need some sort of objectivity here, if possible. We have to strive for objectivity, not, hey, do you think you've got this? Oh, well, you know, I might have. Yeah, no, we need, we need some sort of more specific uh, objectivity and criteria than that. Because I can't think of any reason that working in civil servant offices around the country would more than double your risk of of getting, uh, in fact, it's, it's, nine, it's treble, it's treble the risk of, of getting uh, long COVID. I think that shows the risk of long uh, self-reporting. Uh, in civil service, poor mental health is the main reason for absences, then musculoskeletal, then others, then long COVID. Periods of sick less than 28 working days, uh, the COVID and long COVID accounted for 32.4% of all absences. So I think... This shows us of the ongoing need for objectivity and we need to remove subjectivity from these data because if lots of people are saying they've got long COVID when they haven't, then that's not helping the people that are genuinely suffering with this uh, condition. So interesting, the World Health Organization is sort of intimating the pandemic's kind of on the way down. That's not really reflected in their vaccination strategy or is it? Are they starting to backpedal a little bit? If you watched the last video, maybe has Omicron uh, been replaced by any other more dangerous variant? Absolutely not. There's just a a complete cascade of uh, evolutionary changes in the Omicron, but it's all Omicron. Therefore, we have high levels of cross immunity, very high levels of cross immunity, preventing serious illness and death due to mucosal and natural systemic immunity, which, of course, is pretty uh, wonderful. So we're looking forward to a period of COVID endemicity with common cold type features and continuing, as we've seen in the 28 days data from the World Health Organization, continuing levels of uh, severe illness and death, thankfully. Other things are concerning me. Um, A few influential people have predicted that there's going to be another pandemic. Um, um, I'm going to leave that one there because... um, We just have to hope that they don't know more than we do. So this is the importance of uh, people like you and me uh, remaining vigilant. And uh, thank you for remaining vigilant with me in this video, hopefully, (laughs) hopefully today. Thank you for watching.